Okay, so let's kick off uh, this session, which I've been really, really excited about ever since we added it to the program, uh, called The War on the Past, A War on the Public. And I think, I mean, from statues to old authors, from museums to music, so many of our culture wars and political issues seem to focus on uh, issues related to the past and arguments about the legacy of the past. So yeah, it's not just that there are lots of arguments about the past, but also these arguments seem to be accelerating and focusing on kind of ever newer uh, authors or uh, historical episodes. And so something that only seemed very contemporary only a few moments ago is now considered hopelessly outdated. Um, and sometimes this attitude seems to feel like a, a wholesale rejection of the past, that the whole of history, at least Western history, is just full of rubbish and outdated ideals. Of course, people have always challenged previous generations, and so lots of these, uh, lots of these arguments focus on the idea that, well, haven't we just moved on historically? Aren't we just slightly more modern now? Uh, isn't it right to kind of update and challenge outdated views and bring that forward into public discussion? Aren't we just, uh, the kind of iconoclasts might say, aren't we just moving with the times? It's interesting to note, and this is the second half of our title, The War on the Public, it was interesting for us to note that lots of these battles about history sometimes seem or feel to actually less be about the past than about the present, or at least about certain kind of groups of people in the present. It seems sometimes that those who might wish to cancel historical figures are doing more about re-educating and re-socializing the public uh, right now, especially in the wake of uh, populist upheavals, and such like that means that people feel that those outdated ideals are kind of living on through populism and populist eruptions now. So the focus has to be going back into the past, correcting the past, uh, and updating it for our times. The kind of thrust of this panel that we want to explore is whether these arguments about the past are really about the past, or are they about the, the present? And also, where is the role of the public in this? Are the public, broadly speaking, holders of outdated attitudes, uh, or are they often championing kind of interesting historical moments? So there's plenty for us to dig into, and I'm really delighted that I was asked to chair this session because we've got a really genuinely fantastic panel who I'll introduce briefly in the order that they'll speak. And so sitting uh, over there on my left is Ivan Krastev, who's a political analyst and a fellow for the Institute of Human Sciences uh, IWM in Vienna. He's the chair of the Center for Liberal Strategies, author of the book, Is It Tomorrow Yet? How the Pandemic Changes Europe, which you can get from the bookshop. And more than that, he's kind of one of Europe, um, if not f further afield, kind of the preeminent commentators on major uh, historical and geopolitical crises. So I'm really delighted that Ivan's with us. Also delighted to be joined by another Ivan, Ivan Hewitt, uh, who's a writer and broadcaster, the chief uh, music critic at The Telegraph and a professor of the Royal College of Music. All of that in the biography doesn't necessarily tell you how illuminating his writing and speaking is about classical music. If you're someone like myself who doesn't have particularly much of a background in classical music, I promise you that reading and listening to Ivan will help really illuminate uh, what classical music means and why it might be important for us today. So then sitting uh, next to me on my immediate right is Sean Lang, who's a senior lecturer in history at Anglia Ruskin University, the author of First World War for Dummies and also of What History Do We Need? and also a fellow at the Historical Association and also a kind of very prominent public commentator on issues uh, related to history and the dramatization of that in the present. So Then we've got uh, Professor Robert Toombs, who's an emeritus professor at French history at Cambridge University and the co-editor of History Reclaimed, a genuine public intellectual, someone who has been uh, very much involved in some of these debates about the legacy of the past uh, today and kind of making a real case for why we should take history very seriously. Last, but by no means least, we've got Dr. Ashley Frawley, who's a sociologist and author, a pretty prolific uh, public commentator, host of a great uh, show on and podcast on YouTube that I really recommend checking you out, and uh, very, very active also on Twitter and social media. So I'll ask our panelists to introduce the topic for five or six minutes, and then we'll be very much coming out to uh, audience questions and get a real public conversation started. So, Ivan. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm very relaxed that there is two Ivans on the panel, so <laughs> at least one should do well. Uh, uh, but uh, what I want to do is give you just a paradox that always captures me when we have these conversations, and this is the following. If you go on the opinion polls, 
you're going to see that the majority of Europeans believe that people have been living better before. There is a kind of a very strong wave of nostalgia for the past. Uh, there was a, this year's International Booker Prize went for the Bulgarian author, Georgi Gospodinov, and all his book is about societies that are totally infected with nostalgia, to the extent that Europeans became so much kind of not knowing what to think about the future, that governments organize in every country a referendum in which decade of the 20th century you want to go back. So on one level, you have this strong nostalgia for the past and having the feeling that the past was more interesting, something kind of a more rewarding. And on the other side, you have this war on the monuments of the past, that something was totally wrong with the past. And my idea is particularly coming from a very strong young generation. So I'm much more interested in the sociology of it, where it comes from. And I'm just going to make a three argument in the, this five minutes. The first is, and this is important for me, is if you look at the young generation, they're ready to destroy monuments, but they're not interested to build ones. And this is quite important. Uh, by the way, this is not for the first time that you have this kind of a revolutionary model, uh, moments in which you have younger people who said, we want to destroy all the monuments of the past in the 1920s Soviet Union. But I can imagine that French, during the revolution, it was very strongly. We're starting totally from the beginning. Everything that happened before doesn't matter. But back then, in all these periods, there was a huge interest to build new monuments. Not now. What we are seeing now is a generation that is treating all previous generations as their contemporaries. And being surprised that they're not sharing the same views, uh, the same kind of uh, understanding and judgment of the things. Secondly, I do believe that it has a lot to do with the fact that young people in our society is a very small cohort. This is the most under-discussed minority that exists. They don't have the numbers. In the 1960s, young people have a very big numbers. They have the feeling that they can remake the society. They can remake it even with the power of their vote. Now you have a minorities, small groups, small cohorts. And from this point of view, in order to push your views, you get much more aggressive. Because basically, you otherwise fear that you are not going to be hurt. And thirdly, in my view, this has a lot to do with a total kind of understanding that the only thing that matters basically is personal experience, and the only story that you can tell is your personal story. Suddenly, talking on behalf of somebody that is not yourself is becoming kind of a problem. It's a problem in literature. It's a problem, basically, in history. And I'm saying like this, and because they are really prominent historians with this panel, uh, British-American historian, uh, historian Tony Judd said something that I found very relevant to this debate. He said, starting with the 1990s and the end of the Cold War, we are interested only in the lessons of history. You are not interested in history anymore. We are not interested why different people have been thinking differently in different periods, why they have been experiencing in a different way. And as a result of it, when you basically replace the idea of studying history with the lessons of history, you come in a situation in which you are judging and you are not interested to understand. And uh, to end up on how, as a result of it, you can end up with history, which is not controversial, you know that there is a lot of monuments in Europe with different statements or generals on their horses. Just opposite to the Bulgarian parliament, and I'm Bulgarian, uh, there is a, a monument of a Russian king who liberated Bulgaria, but before it destroyed uh, basically tens of thousands of Poles. So what are you doing with this? And the Bulgarian artist found basically the solution. He said, the only thing that can be left on monuments these days is only the horses. <laughs> because the horse is innocent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ivan. Uh, Ivan, over to you. Uh, the other Ivan. Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, good afternoon, everybody. My field is the arts, particularly classical music. And so that's where I'm coming from in my uh, few minutes. And I'd like to be devil's advocate just for a couple of minutes and start by suggesting that the war on the past might sometimes be a really good thing. Um, if you look at the history of the arts, you'll see that it has often been so. 
You just, just a cursory glance back will show writers, painters, composers, architects, constantly declaring it's time to throw off tradition and, in effect, declare a war on the past. A few examples. The Salon des Refusés in Paris, 1863, where various modernist artists, in particular Manet, decided that they could no longer stand the stultifying rules laid down by the Academy, the Royal Academy, and so they decided to just ignore the Academy and put on their own exhibition. Or take another example, the Lyrical Ballads, Wordsworth and Coleridge, published 1798, were in effect a declaration of war against the fusty, heavy, ornate, Latinate poetry of the previous generation. They wanted something new, something more demotic, connected to how ordinary people spoke. Coming a bit closer to our own time, think of someone like Ezra Pound, you know, founder of the, or co-founder of the great Images School of Modern Poetry. Make it new was his watchword. It was his slogan, and you can't do that without also having a war on the past. And just one more example from my own art form, classical music. The great French modernist Pierre Boulez, who declared he wanted to blow up all the opera houses. Um, and, and in fact, he was, in a sense, true to his word, because he never wrote an opera. And he once declared about museums, I detest them. I cannot bear this contemporary habit for preserving the least knickerbocker button from the 18th century. You know, he just couldn't bear it. So, you, looking at these examples and innumerable others, you might say that making war on the past is actually the oldest artistic tradition. However, I would say um, no. I think what we're looking at is something profoundly different in the history of arts in the West and probably anywhere in the world for two reasons. Um, these hot-headed new radicals who want to throw out Titian and Michelangelo and Beethoven and what have you have no actual interest in the arts as such. It's a very peculiar thing. Um, it reminds me of what Ivan just said, actually, that they are only interested in the lesson that art might give us. In art itself, the actual stuff, you know, how you handle paint in painting, how you handle notes in music, no interest. Um, so... Um, why? Because they're often the product, so they tell us, of a white supremacist or colonialist mindset, in which case they must be condemned or, or at least held at arm's length, you know, the way you might hold at arm's length a piece of fish that's gone off, you know. That's, that's the attitude of many towards the, the historical arts these days. And the result is an extraordinarily cliché-ridden form of new, um, I think the phrase is committed art that's emerging. Um, So-called brave you know, how often we hear that phrase now, brave pieces of art or music, which rehash the tiredest cliches from the modernist playbook as very easily digestible symbols of, you know, horror or oppression or whatever, usually jammed alongside the treacliest film music cliches representing, you know, triumph over suffering. And the irony is that this utter failure as art to my way of thinking, condemns these works to be also failures as protests. So a, a, a failure to engage with the materials of art is, is, is damaging at its very core. And this goes to my second point, which is that the truly significant artists, among those radicals I mentioned and many others that I did not, um, was actually undertaken in a spirit of love and respect. And these artists, with a few exceptions, eventually joined hands with a tradition that previously they were so keen to diss. So it's not so much a war against the past that they were leading as a war with it. It's a kind of tussle, if you like, to wrest from the past that which is needed for the new conditions of the present. It's, I would say it's a battle prompted by love. A, a sort of Jacob wrestling with the angel is how I would describe these modernists. Um, the examples are too numerous to mention, but just for one or two, think of Picasso, the great radical whose whole later career is really a journey through the past. Or think of James Joyce, whose magnum opus, Ulysses, is an attempt to recreate an ancient Greek epit, epic on the streets of Dublin. Or finally, to take again a, an example from my own art form, Debussy, who launched the adventure of modern music pretty much single-handedly in the 1890s, but then later in life became a, 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 a refined and rather austere French neoclassicist and would sign himself on his pieces, Musicien Français, so no longer the cosmopolitan modernist. 
So what, what do we notice about all these, these examples and others I could mention? It's that their return to the past comes late in life. First comes youthful rebellion, led by the ego and the naughty desire to épater les bourgeois. And later comes maturity and the realization that to achieve anything in this life, you have to submit to something bigger than yourself. And what does that tell us about the current war on the past in the arts? I would say that because the war is led by an ideologically inspired hatred, this all-important moment of humility and submission can never happen. And because of that, the people who lead this war, the, you know, the artists, all those earnest museum curators who pin notices to, to, to pictures telling us that the, um, that the chair, the, the uh, subject of the portrait is sitting on, came from colonialized exploited wood or whatever, um, and all the professors of decolonialism, they're condemned to a perpetual, bad-tempered, adolescent sort of sulk with respect to the past. They look back to the past only for those things that they demand that will be useful to them now. And if they don't find them, they angrily reject it, like those children who refuse to understand that if mummy and daddy do sometimes contradict them, it really is for their own good. So just to sum up, I would say the art of the past is many things. I mean, it's a source of pleasure, a challenge to those who have talent to see if they can rise to the challenge. But most of all, it's a test of emotional and intellectual maturity, a test which, unfortunately, many of our cultural masters seem incapable of meeting. Right, thank you. Right, Sean, please. Thank you. Um, what struck me about the title of this debate was that it was about a war on the past rather than about history. And it seems to me that there are three things that are in our uh, thinking that we need to be aware of, and we also need to be aware of the, of the distinction between them. History, the past, and myth. And I think, in a sense, what we have to decide is which of these do we really want. Many years ago, Arthur Marwick, professor of history at the Open University, wrote that um, society, in a very real sense, needs history. And indeed, he said that a modern, high-tech society needs more history than most. And he was really talking about the way in which all societies need to find their roots in order to have some sense of who they are. And when you look at modern history in the public sphere, you might think that, in fact, a lot of our concern is ill-founded, because on the face of it, history is flourishing in publishing, in broadcasting, and particularly in podcast, which is the sort of the most recent development, I suppose, in broadcasting, if you think of the success of the, um, the rest of history uh, podcasts. Um, Museums and heritage centres still attract very large numbers of visitors and indeed a lot of publicity. All of that would suggest that actually um, you know, there's a huge public appetite for history and that in a sense Arthur Marwick was right. But that is allied with a very different approach in what I would call official indifference. That is to say, for example, um, the fact that history has, uh, is not compulsory beyond 14 in schools, and indeed in many cases it's dropped a little bit earlier than that. And that even with the national curriculum, academies, and there's a huge, massive um, official drive to academize schools, means that schools don't even have to follow that curriculum. The emphasis upon STEM subjects, science, technology, English, and maths, again, tends to marginalize the importance of history and we see this in the fall in numbers of students taking history at GCSE A level and in higher education which is really now quite quite uh, noticeable um, the public discourse about history has, of course, been bitter and contentious, and with statues have been mentioned of an obvious example, names of buildings, again, which um, you know, have been changed because of public um, uh, awareness and anger about the people that they're named after. And museums have been very much caught up in this. In some cases, like the British Museum, rather caught in the crossfires uh, about the Elgin marbles or about the Benin bronzes, which I noticed were in the news to, uh, this morning. Or in the case of a museum like the Pitt Rivers in Oxford, very much taking a sort of proactive line in what we must call the culture wars. So I think it's fair to ask what exactly is happening. And it seems to me that Marwick was right that society needs a history, needs a sense of history, but that that hasn't been, as it were, provided by uh, um, the, the usual sources, notably, of course, in, within education. And as a result, other groups have been able to fit in with their own agenda. Um, the obvious one, I suppose, being Black Lives Matter, um, um, particularly after the murder of, of George Floyd. Um, one can look at David Olyshoga on just about every aspect of, of 
the BBC iPlayer. I did one that just switched on, and his face was on nearly every tile in front of me. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, the drive for diversity, not at, all, not at all a bad thing, but um, nevertheless, given us um, a, a very noticeable priority by groups like the Historical Association. And what this does is absolutely right. It looks, indeed, much as Ivan was just saying, it looks again at history, perfectly good thing to do, looks at British history, looks at imperial history front with new eyes. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's the very nature of the subject. But it becomes a problem when the a uh, new way of looking at it is so monofocused. And the monofocus at the moment, it will change, but at the moment, it's race. Race is absolutely everything. And indeed, I've heard one history, young history teacher saying that, as far as he's concerned, history is only about race. Um, race and, and linked, of course, um, with that is the story of slavery. But it's not just that. It's not just a selection of a particular topic, because, as I say, that will change. There will be other ones um, in the future. But the assumption that the issues of the past were seen in exactly the same way as they are today. In other words, the past is no different from today. And a good example of that um, is the outrage, and it was in the news, the BBC News this very morning, about slavery, abolition, and compensation to slaveholders. Um, now, to, it, it, one can see why you get uh, outraged at the fact that slaveholders, slave owners, were compensated at the abolition of slavery, but that is actually to misunderstand 19th century thinking about, about the nature of slavery, about the nature of property. It, was, it, would, be under, it would be outrageous if it happened now, it's, but the 19th century was not now. Similarly about what, why didn't women have the vote, much of the arguments about that rather understand 19th century understandings not of women but of the vote. Um, so in effect, we're often saying that the past is the same as the present, but in different clothes. And popular culture reflects this. You see this in costume dramas, where the attitudes, the ethnic diversity, reflect today rather than the time that's, that's being portrayed. Now, there's nothing new about this, because people have always looked at the past, always, in order to understand the present. They've always applied current uh, understandings to the past. You only have to look at Shakespeare's plays to get a very well-known example of that. But it's bigger now because of the power of communication. Um, so, for example, um, when you look at the case of Edward um, Colston in Bristol, the slave trader whose statue was thrown into the river, it seems to me that the question is not so much him being a slaver, but why he was honoured by the city of Bristol for so long. That's the question which wasn't asked by the people who were throwing him into the river. And it seems to me this is an example where the past is not comforting. It goes against modern certainties and comforts. So issues like, for example, the tradition of racism and anti-Semitism on the left, uh, ever since the Nazis, we've thought of this as a right-wing issue. It wasn't. Indeed, anti-Semitism began as a very proudly held label on the progressive left in the 19th century. Or African slavers, not Europeans, but African slavers. And I don't know if you're familiar with the film Amistad, but the central character in that, Singe, um, who is uh, an African who's kidnapped and, and taken to America as a slave, and it shows him returning to his homeland, and it mentions that his wife um, was, was eventually sold into slavery. What it doesn't tell you is that he himself became a slaver. Um, and it brings us to myth, because in effect, by demolishing myths, we create new ones. We want myth. And we want myth because it is comforting. We fancy it in foundation myths for countries and for institutions and indeed for individuals. We like myth busting, but only when it creates new ones. So I will finish by saying this. A war on the past is not something we want, um, and I would hate to see it. The past is horrible, the past is difficult. What I want to see is a war on myth and the, and the creation of new ones. Great, thanks a lot. Robert, please. Uh, right, well, th um, I, I much enjoyed what's already been said, and, and I agree with it, it's, and it's, it's been very useful as trying to understand and explain what's going on. Um, I, I'm going to be a bit more polemical and a bit less, as it were, understanding, because I, and I'm rather more cynical about this than I was until quite recently. Yes, I think an attack on the past is an attack on the public, um, in two ways, at least two ways. One is because it's a deliberate attempt to undermine the solidarity on which the democratic nation state is based. Um, and we've known this for a long time. Uh, it was said by J.S. Mill, it was said by the French philosopher Ernest Renan when he talked about the basis of a voluntary political association as opposed to one based on force and compulsion is the sharing of a, of a rich heritage of memories uh, and we need that, uh, and that's what an attempt is being made to destroy. Um, it's not simply, as, as its exponents often say, to um, 
tell other stories, to face up to the dark parts of our past and so on, which has been done for a very long time. It's really an attempt to say that there is, no, there is only a dark side. And that's why many of the public attacks that take place are not um, primarily on the villains, um, though Colston arguably was one, but on the heroes, on Churchill, on Gladstone, on Peel. Um, if, they, them, if they are to be cast as villains, then there are no, there's no one to whom we can look up and no one to whom we can feel, of whom we can feel proud. So it's not just a redressing of the balance, it's an attempt to create a kind of nihilistic view, I think, and I think you referred to the, the, the desire to destroy but not to build. In the, of course, and also, as, as Sean has said, it's to, it's to recast the whole of history a, around a small number of themes, slavery, racism, colonialism. Um, now, this has very little to do with with history. History is about the understanding of the past. We've, I think we probably all agree on that. This, uh, a, a young scholar in Cambridge said the other day, and I thought this was rather good, he said the reason for studying history is to recover forgotten ways of thinking and hence to challenge our own preconceptions. And I think you could say that the approach to history taken by many activists today is absolutely the opposite of that. It's to silence the voices of the past and to strengthen our own preconceptions in the present. The other way in which this is an attack on the public is through the process of what's called decolonization, which I won't say much about. It's getting more and more familiar. But what it is is really an attack on the whole of Western cultural tradition in the arts, in music, in politics, in ideas. Um, to defend that is not to say that it was perfect or that it was uh, faultless. We all know that it wasn't. But to try to destroy it, uh, to remove it from our understanding uh, is, again, another nihilistic process. It has very little to do with real decolonization or real colonialism, which are very complex phenomena. It's, it's an abstract idea taken from books, books like those of France Fanon and, uh, and Edward Said, a decolonization that has nothing to do with colonialism but which is simply uh, a simplification, an abstract like capitalism, like bourgeoisie, like proletariat, which is used to create a certain, uh, to give force to a certain present day political agenda. Um, now, if it were a good agenda, we might say, well, okay, we can sacrifice the past. We can even regard it with contempt. But what it is nevertheless is, as I think Sean was implying, a real lack of interest in the reality of other societies, those that live before ours. And that is a terribly narrow view and one that, that impoverishes us and which makes us less able to understand ourselves and our own society because we can't look back to the past in history as in the arts. Great, thanks a lot, Robert. <laughs> and finally, we turn to Ashley. So the past is often seen as a place where the problems of today began, where they were initially produced. Um, and so the past becomes a source of the badness of the present, the general kind of sense that this is a real bad world we're in. I recently um, did a podcast where I spoke with uh, Jenny Bristow, who's very good on these topics, wrote about sociology of generations and so on. And we talked about um, the relationship between generations and so on and about how young people in particular today are encouraged to believe that most social problems started with their parents and their grandparents, that it's their grandparents and grandparents that were ultimately, um, are ultimately complicit in the problems of now. And um, that this is, we went on to say, this is a really bad way of thinking about social problems. Problems are a lot more complex than your parents being real mean and bad. <laughs> um, and it deflects attention from the really tough business of thinking hard about why things go wrong and admitting that maybe some things have gone right. Um, but the very first comment, this is on, my podcast is on YouTube if you want to follow. <laughs> the very first comment was undoubtedly from a, a young person who I don't think listened, <laughs> um, but was very angry and exemplified very, very well this outlook that we're encouraged to believe today, where the problems of the past 
uh, problems of the present are, are started in the past, the old generation is complicit, and said, you know, it's amazing that you're talking about generations, but you never talked to us. You didn't talk to us, Gen Z. You know, you had this whole conversation. You didn't talk to a single young person. And it's your fault. And now we have to clean up the mess that you made. <laughs> you know, not us in the podcast, but generally, our generation. And it's interesting because um, the, even the way that we talk about generations, where we're encouraged to think about generations as the source of social problems, as the relationship between generations, you know, your parents raised you poorly, and that's why you've got problems, or your grandparents didn't, were you know, terrible with the environment, and that's why we have environmental problems. Uh, even when we talk about social problems in that way, in relationship to generations um, is really tenuous. So it's like, it's, you know, has anyone noticed that Gen X is like gone now? Nobody really talks about Gen X. People say like, okay, boomer, to uh, my, a person that I work with who's clearly Gen X. And I'm a millennial, and I'm pretty much destined for boomerhood now. Like, <laughs> like okay, anybody who's old is just a boomer. So it's like, uh, it becomes this war between the older generation and the young. And then the young are supposed to solve all the problems and totally rewrite the script, but not draw on the past, because the past is where all the bad things started. So. In our, and it's not necessarily young people that are to blame for this. They're told constantly the older generation is at fault for the problems of today. And you have to solve these problems now. It's this terrible abdication of responsibility on the part of you know, people in power, policymakers, and so on. Say, young people today, you're the future, you're the future. And, that, and they're thinking, I've got to solve all these problems? And, and, and use nothing that came before. Um, so I think what happens is the past is constructed as a place where problems began, and it produced a bad present. And now I'm on to what I actually wanted to talk about, which is creates a, 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 a present in which we are all alienated from each other. Because the past um, is the place where my trauma began, which is different than your trauma. And the one thing that we wind up having in common is that everybody, in some way, is guilty. You're guilty because your ancestors did this, or you're guilty because you, you um, benefit from patriarchy or white supremacy or whatever it might be. Um, and I'll just give you a, an example of this um, to, to sort of finish out, where the past becomes this sort of reservoir um, for social problems, and it, and it leads to this alienation in the present where we, we have no, nothing in common with each other. Um, in Canada, a while back, in 2021, there was allegedly found in, uh, outside of a residential school in Kamloops, um, BC, uh, bodies, allegedly, over 200 bodies of indigenous children from the residential school era. That's since been contested. But at the time, this produced an enormous amount of soul searching in Canada, and the, they um, decided to fast track some policy for a new holiday called the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. And so everybody, all Canadians were invited to sort of self-flagellate for the past. And um, a, a, a journalist went to my sister, who's never, ever talked to a journalist before, because they said, oh, we're trying to talk to all these indigenous people, you know, and hey, we got an indigenous person right here. You know, tell us, tell us about your trauma. Tell us about how bad it was for you. And my sister is very nervous about this. And uh, so she starts like babbling, because she knew what that journalist wanted. She wanted an atrocity tale. Tell me about how the past defines who you are today. And so she starts nervously telling this story. And I'm sorry, I tell this story all the time. If you know me, you've heard it before, but I like this story a lot. We're walking through, we're on the reserve when we were kids. We're walking on an island. She stepped over a log, and she accidentally stepped on a beehive. And all these bees start coming out, and they're stinging her and everything. She's running around getting chased by bees, screaming. And we're all laughing. We thought this was hilarious, as kids do. And uh, we took, my aunt was there, and we're all making fun of her. And uh, we said, Tamara, your, your Indian name is Dances with Bees. <laughs> <laughs> so the more that she like, ran around, the more the bees were following her. And she was stamping her feet, and she looked like she was dancing. So we said, Dances with Bees, that's your Indian name. Anyway, so she tells this story to the journalist. And uh, she gets the article back a few days later, and she goes, Ashley, oh my god, this can't be printed. And she sent it to me, <laughs> and it starts out. They call me Dances with Bees. <laughs> I recall when I was young, walking in the reservation. I stepped upon a bee's nest. 
And I was inundated. <laughs> it was like really romanticized and so on. And at the end of the story, my grandmother had put, my grandmother knew that the sap from one of the trees was an anti-inflammatory and she had put it on my sister. And it was like, my grandmother, the great medicine woman, <laughs> put the sap. Uh, and it was really ridiculous, but why I find it, I feel bad for the journalist because she, did, she only knew two stories about indigenous people, um, noble savage and indigenous victim. And she didn't get the indigenous victim, so she went for the noble savage. But in both of those stories, indigenous people are trapped in the past. That becomes who you are. And she couldn't understand that indigenous people could joke and use common cultural references from a movie from the 90s, which was popular at the time, and you know, joke about Indian names, but also take them very seriously, that we could be dynamic people that are part of history and belong to the future and so on. Um, and so, this leads to a sense of, of alienation from each other, right? When I say I'm just like you, I also am a dynamic person. I have an active and selective engagement with the culture that I call my own. I am saying that we build a future together, that the past belongs to all of us, and so does the future. Great, thank you, Ashley. I had that, I had that down as well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, let's come out to you and get a bit of a conversation going. Um, yeah, no, great speeches from everyone. Um, one of the things I think a lot of you touched on was sort of, I guess, modern people, how we actually understand history, whether we can understand it in the context of them. But more importantly as well, just sort of understanding the wealth of history there is. It's not just about Britain. Um, one thing I find amongst my age group is a lot of people know about what Britain's done from sort of like social media and that in of itself is a bad thing because social media doesn't always give the truth about stuff. Um, so I think there's definitely a question about education and how we educate people to be able to know a lot for one but also to be able to go away and critically think themselves. So my question to the panellists is I guess how do you think we can improve the education system on history to one um, give a balanced idea, because obviously we don't want to be indoctrinating children with a certain curriculum set up to make them think a certain way, but also how can we actually get them to go away and critically think in a way where they're going to be able to kind of tackle the things we're talking about, understand things in the context of then versus now, um, and sort of improve these, uh, these, these discussions nowadays. I'm glad you draw a little bit of a distinction between history and the past, because isn't history inevitably a kind of as much a comment on the time the, the time in which the history is written as in the time in which it's studied. I can remember I went to school in a very old-fashioned school, learned about kings and queens, our famous heroes. A few years later, I went to college and heard some Marxist revisionist history, and now there are new concerns. So it isn't, isn't it the nature of history that it will always reflect the concerns of the day? Yeah, maybe uh, to be a bit more positive, because I agree that the war in the past is a bad thing, and it deracinates us from what we were and leaves us a bit atomized and everything. But there is something to be said about, um, if you like, a critique of pure reason, not only of the past, but of the present. And I think if you look back in history, uh, if you take Voltaire, for instance, uh, he published his siècle, Le Siècle de Louis the Fourteenth, which kind of is a new history, historical work, which analyzes the past uh, in an enlightenment spirit, basically saying, well, if we look at the past, it was all a bunch of unenlightened, uh, indarkened bunch of, uh, um, you know, barbarians. And he critiqued it very much in the way woke people do now. He wouldn't even dignify ancient Egypt much uh, because he thought it was all superstition and so on. Uh, he fundamentally changed the way we looked at history. But that was a good way of doing it, I think, because he had a point. And then if you look at, uh, for example, America and Thomas Paine, he said, you know, the past is used to justify the present, for example, in ancient Greece, and at other times it is used to uh, demonize, you know, democracy today. We can't have democracy because the ancient Greeks had democracy and that wasn't good. They, they killed Socrates and so on. So what about the thing the Enlightenment figures said, which is the past is not a model because it, was all, it will always be myth, turned into myth if we use it as a model for the present, but something which is more based on pure reason and principles which are fundamentally ahistorical. Isn't that perhaps a danger there where the woke are actually setting themselves their own downfall by making pure reason a thing again, which could kill them in the end? 
Right, so uh, I think you're wrong about Voltaire and, and Thomas Paine, because what they were doing was they were quite uh, legitimately reacting to aspects of the past. I think the war against the past today is fundamentally different, because the war against the past is determined to destroy the legacy of human civilization in every respect. And virtually every gain, particularly of Western civilization, has been called into question and has been deemed morally inferior. Whether it's Aristotle and the Greeks, whether it's the Judeo-Christian tradition, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, they have either been racialized or they've been seen as a patriarchal nightmare or they've been seen as oppressive to transgender ideology. So there's nothing left, in a sense, of, from this legacy. And I think that the thing that people, we are often missing when we're looking at the war against the past, what distinguishes it from any other moment in human history that I know of, is that the temporal distinction between the present and the past has been eradicated. One of the distinguishing features of today is an attempt to fix the problems of the past rather than to deal with the problems of the present. And that's why you have this situation where anachronistic thinking, that's to say reading history backwards, has acquired such a momentum that, for example, when uh, archaeologists find a body uh, of a woman in ancient Egypt, we are told that it's illegitimate to call that a woman because we don't know how that person would have identified. <laughs> and we are told that, and, and, they, and they say this in, in, in all seriousness, we are told that uh, Joan of Arc uh, was likely to have been either a lesbian or transgender because she wore metal clothing. And in fact, every single woman who wasn't an archetypal femi feminine individual is all of a sudden rebranded as trans. And when you look at this, uh, this, this done systematically, something new has occurred. And it's even infected the history profession. Because there used to be a time when in history, to be anachronistic, to be presentist, was seen as a crime. Even the Marxist historian, Eric Hobsbawm, said that presentism is a crime of history. That's to say, when you simply look for reflections of yourself in the past, that is a crime. But today, serious historians in the Anglo-American world are actually publishing books and articles that defend presentism, that actually argue that what's really important is not what really happened, what's really important is what it says about myself. Mm. So this narcissistic projection backwards not only destroys the legacy of our civilization, but what it also does is it polarizes history as a rigorous discipline that actually tries to make sense of our predicament, what's specific about our, our predicament. It tries to have a sense of historical specificity instead of destroying this distinction between the present and the past. Okay, thanks. Right. We'll take, we'll take one more at the front, and then we'll bring back the panel. I just wondered whether there was a link here between the way the young people view history now and a general sort of dumbing down into education um, and the way things are presented. So, you know, I went to school in the 70s and 80s, and I just remember history being quite serious and a bit stuffy. And I think in order to have made it more sort of glamorous for young people, they've kind of done it in sort of bite size. Well, this is what it would have been like for you being in, the, in that era. And documentaries are a lot more sort of... Um, they were a lot more dense in those days. I remember very serious sort of heavy-going historical documentaries in those days. Museums were a lot less kind of fun and funky and... It's, it's all, everything has just sort of been dumbed down, it seems. And I think now it's, it's really easy to just look at everything for a really simple oppression, oppressor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, that's the easiest way to look at things. And I think people are just naturally kind of like almost lazy. They just, they just want an easy kind of simple explanation. <laughs> and it's like, oh, these are the goodies and these are the baddies. And, you know, that's how to look at history. I don't know, it just seems... Yeah. No, no, thank you very much. Uh, even some first thoughts. Yeah, Th thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to, uh, to concentrate because I do believe several of the questions were also very much reflected of what uh, uh, Professor Frank Fioretti said. And here's my story. You cannot talk about the past and the present if you don't include the future as a part of it. There is no relations between two of them. There is always need of a third man. 
And from this point of view, it's quite interesting because what we, I do believe we see is this war on the past is very much based on the deficit of the future. Go back to the 19th century. You go with Freud who said, the truth about you is in the past. See the relations with your parents. And then you go to Marx who said, the truth is in the future. See the relations with your children. From this point of view, what I do believe we have, and this comes this intensity, is that basically you have people, and particularly a generation, which for different reasons, fear of climate change, fear of demographic change, starts to experience the world like being the last man. Suddenly you have the feeling that, I don't know, am I going to have children? I don't know, is there going to be a future at all? Future became so threatening that you start judging on the past in the way as if there is no future. And this explains why, in a certain way, you're talking in the way you're pronouncing a verdict. And I found this very different, because to be honest, there was an important radical moment. For example, during the Bolshevik Revolution, all the previous tradition was declared in a kind of illegitimate, but there was a people that you're going to believe that are moving the world in the way you want. These people have disappeared. In a certain way, nobody in the past is innocent. And I have, probably I'm wrong, but I believe that it has much more with the way we feel about the future than about anything else. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, Robert, some thoughts? Right, yes. No. <laughs> we'll, we'll take it as read that all of the speakers are very urbane and erudite, and so therefore don't need an applause every time. <laughs> um, well, I'd like to just mention um, the, the question about history, about the way in which history has been dumbed down, as you said, or the way in which um, uh, history is neglected in our, in our system. I, I guess it was because it was once thought that people would know it already. It wasn't really necessary for people to be taught so much in school. But we are, I, I would say, unique in Europe in the, in the lack of interest our education system shows in, in history. Um, what, what can you do about it? I mean, I think the rot goes pretty deeply, but there is a move to, to, to concentrate more on, though Sean knows much more about this than I do, on, uh, on what's called knowledge-rich history. In other words, not, not, not using history just as a, as a way of telling stories or, or, make, or, or, or putting out messages, but trying to help children to understand really what it, what, what it was like, to, that they would actually be more equipped to understand it and to understand what's said to them about it. Uh, I'm on a, a panel advising on the creation of a, a model history curriculum, but uh, as Sean says, probably not many schools will use it, so perhaps it's all a waste of time. But there is at least a move to try to improve the teaching of history in schools. Universities are a different matter. There, I think the problems are, are very different and uh, perhaps even more deep-seated. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, yeah, coming over to you. Uh, Thank you, Robert. That's nice to be told. I was right. <laughs> um, I was a teacher for many years in schools, and I would say that I recognise the problem that both of you mentioned, but I don't think the answer lies within schools, because you've got to bear in mind that the time allocated to history is limited and always will be. But there's a, lo a lot of people learn their history, in fact, most people learn most of their history not within school, but from broadcasts, from films, feature films, from TV history, and so on. And I think it's there that we, if we want to see a major change, that we've got to concentrate a lot of our efforts. I don't think it's no point, any point in just looking to schools as a sort of magic bullet that will change everything. And what it strikes me about the um, history that is uh, available through broadcasts is that it is it's essentially narrative, and it's essentially one person's um, view. Even when you get interpretation, so even when you get interviews with others, it's essentially tell us a little bit more about what happened. What you don't get um, really in history in the public arena is the very nature of history as it should be and certainly is or ought to be in universities, which is that it's a matter of debate. You very seldom get historical debate on, um, you know, in, in broadcasting in the way that you do with political questions. There's no sort of history equivalent of any of the news, um, you know, the approaches to news coverage where you do get different points of view. So always you essentially get one point of view which is put forward, usually, of course, the presenters. That, I think, has enormous influence in terms of changing the public perception, changing the parameters of understanding, and indeed influencing students and, and the future generations of teachers. And I would say that 
that's where you really need to concentrate efforts if you want to get um, a, a diversity of opinions, outlooks, thinking, and what have you. Yeah, great. Ashley. So this idea that a war on the past is destroy is, is you know, an all attempt to destroy civilization. Um, I think that's, I think the way to understand that, for me anyway, is we have this sort of ethos of endless disruption. Disruption in itself is good. Endless subversion. You think, like, why do so many activists demand things that don't make any sense? <laughs> why do they demand things that couldn't possibly work in practice? Well, the point is to jolt you out of your comfortable ways of thinking. You know? <laughs> subversion in itself is is an end goal, that's it. The, it's just endless subversion. Because as I said, this world is bad, they think, and it shouldn't go on. Um, and so the most extreme version of this, I'm sorry to say, um, was when we saw people actually celebrating Hamas violence in Israel. Because that was the extreme version of the same ethos of disruption. It didn't matter they didn't, that the next day, even worse violence was almost certainly going to come. Like, what did they think was going to happen? It didn't matter. They weren't thinking about the future. It was that moment, that act of disruption that was an end in itself that made it worth celebrating. You don't think about beyond. It's the disruption of the everyday. That's all that matters. And in fact, if you think about the, the tomorrow, if you think about the future, that will involve imposing your will and taking a stand on a better world, on a be saying, this, I think, is a better way to live. This is how I think we should all live. And people are a little bit uncertain about that. It's all, I have my truth, and you have your truth, and so on. Um, so on this idea of the past being used as a model, um, and that, that that's a, a bad thing, I, I think that's true. I think to paraphrase, paraphrase and build on Carol, uh, Carol, <laughs> Carl Mannheim, um, for conservative thinkers, all meaning is gained from a reference point in the past. For today's presentists, and I think they are presentists, they think of themselves as progressive, but their reference point, their reference point is in the present, in an atomized and individuated self. Mm -hmm. For the true progressive, however, the past is, a, is a, a reservoir whose mistakes and triumphs we can use. Like we use scientific studies. You can think about the past like an empirical study in how to live. And we can see what people did and use that to understand and, and for us to also live out our empirical study of how to live as human beings that we then pass on to the next generation. We can think about how to fix the world like, like scientists do by building on what came before. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks for discovering a Mannheim's trans uh, identity as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Ivan. Thank you. Yes, um, I wonder whether the, the ground for this present trend for disruption with no thought for the future wasn't laid maybe 100 years ago with some of the great pioneer modernists. I, I was very interested by what the gentleman said back there. I didn't entirely understand your point about uh, Voltaire, but I, you seem to be suggesting that there could be such a thing as a kind of hypertrophy of Enlightenment principles, which might lead you to be blind to realities. Forgive me if I've entirely misunderstood you. That, that's what I took from it. And this made me think about the, you know, some of the early modernists, you know, a century ago, who, who were indeed um, drunk on enlightenment principles of rationality and thought that they could remake a certain discipline free of the superstitions of the past. You know, I mean, one of the things I love about the arts is that um, they have two things that guide them. Rules of thumb and rules. The rules are rationally grounded. They're often rooted in some ancient aesthetic premise such as the beauty of symmetry or, or, or beauty itself, indeed. Rules of thumb are things like don't mix those two colors. They're things like don't use the bottom B natural on a bassoon because it doesn't sound very good. The B flat is much better. And you need both to make an art, honestly. Um, and there were certain artists of the, power, of, of, of the modernist movement who thought they could do without both rules of thumb and rules. Or, or no, no, forgive me, no, let me get that right. Who thought they could do without the kind of inherited wisdom of rules of thumb in order to pursue single-mindedly rules. I mean, I'm thinking of people like Le Corbusier, you know, who, who wanted to trash the entire history of architecture so that he could, he could pursue his dream of a modular architecture based on the proportions of the human 
uh, form, frame. It was a kind of rationalism gone mad. Or, or, you know, or think of the modern movement in, in, uh, in post-war modern music, where, to go back to my, my, my cast of, um, of, of um, rebellers that I mentioned earlier, Pierre Boulez, he was the one who didn't grow up. You know, I said most of them grow up and throw off and stop being adolescent. He never did, bless him. He, he carried on being intransigent and hating museums to the bitter end. And, and uh, you know, for him, it, you know, music wasn't music unless it was being built on strictly rational principles. And so he, and so he, he was uh, obliged, it was a very melancholy fate that he suffered. He was obliged to throw out everything in a sense that he knew. Um, and so, um, in, in a sense, this is going against him. But I was saying, you know, without, without that rooted, rootedness in rules of thumb and the material reality of the arts that, that, that history embodies, because after all, m materials are, are historically formed, you know, it's, they're, they're not merely physical, you know, the note E flat is not, just a, it's not just a frequency, it's a historically determined thing, without them, we're lost. Great, thanks a lot. Um, let's come straight back out to the audience. The writer and philosopher G.K. Chesterton once said, never remove a fence until you learn why it was put there in the first place. <laughs> and the point he was making is that things have happened in the past for a reason. And if you want to understand the present, you need to know what those reasons from, from the past are. And the problem with today's hot-headed radicals, as one of the panelists put them, is that they're not interested in learning from the past. They come along and they see a fence and they say, I don't like it. It's got to go. Uh, I'm not interested in why it was put there. It offends my sense of what's right and what's wrong. And so you pull down the fence, and of course, only later do you realise there was a very good reason why that fence was there. Now, of course, what's really being torn down by these hot-headed radicals is not just fences, but it's the basic principles on which our civilization is built. And that's why I think the war on history is really a war on our civilization. Well, just to take that point a little bit further, and the war on our civilization is actually a war on all of our agency. So not to become too narcissistic about it, but the very idea of humans enacting ourselves on the world, if it is consistently trashed and demolished and presented as toxic and damaging, and, and, and then what is to be done ever? In fact, what you want to do is you just want to accept that we're all terrible, we're nasty. Look at all the terrible things we've done in the past. Everything about enlightened thinking, democracy, virtue, values, all of the things that we've stood on the shoulders of our giant, stood on the shoulders of giants for, all of those aspirations have to be put in a box and we have to just accept our lot that is prescribed uh, by this new agenda. And I think in that sense, the demand to know more, to look back historically, but also to look to the future with a view that we can curate and shape a better one through understanding the past, but also enacting on the present now is something that's really essential. And that is the role for the public and for all of us. The art shapes the culture. Uh, and like, you know, the media sort at the moment is currently like the biggest art form or your television programs, your Netflix, all that sort of stuff. And then um, the people who write this stuff, they're all shaped from these institutions, it's all critical social justice, it's all sandwiched in there, and essentially says that everything that we've done or ever done is bad, and it's, it's not true, because, I mean, we, the British, we conducted one of the largest military operations ever to end the transatlantic slave trade. You know, men fought with their lives and gave the blood to end it. That's what they did. I want to see a programme at least once where we did something right. The one time when we did something right, I want to see it. I want to see Royal Navy sailors. I want to see the Marines with like the locally recruited African lads, because that's what happened. But I want to see them sinking slave ships and putting their feathers to the sword. That's what I want to see. Just once, just something where we could put something decent on the telly, where we did something right that's actually historically accurate for a change. I think we can all agree everywhere there's a war on the past, but Mr. Toon said something about the nation state, and I think that really cut to it. Because this is a war against the nation state, it's a war against democracy, and it's obviously a war against uh, the Enlightenment. But we need to think about who is carrying out this war, and I don't think it's kids throwing a statue in the, in the river, it's more up there with the cultural elites, and it's a 40-year project that starts with the postmodern left in the early 80s, 
that said that uh, the, the, the Enlightenment had to go and uh, they put all their faith in hyper-globalisation as an economic theory and this is the, the cultural wing of it, clearly, because um, in 1989 they said it was the end of history because the European Commission had been developed and Fukurama said, here we are. And they still believe that. But hyper-globalisation hasn't worked. It's a failure. So I suppose the question I'm going to ask, either is a kickback, because their project is failing, because it doesn't make economic sense, globalisation. It's going in reverse. So why should the, the cultural wing of it have any credence uh, beyond their own uh, power? Professor Toots, you mentioned earlier Ernst Renan in his lecture on what is a nation. And he very provocatively argues in the same lecture that sometimes it's important to forget things in the past. He makes reference to the um, Arvision Crusade in the 13th century or the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre in the 16th century, and that for a Frenchman living in the 19th century, they had to forget certain things in their past in order to overcome trauma and be a nation. Is, are there circumstances, do you agree with them? Are there circumstances where we should forget things in the past so that they don't bring these traumas back into the present? I really agreed and liked the point that was made about the future. E.H. Um, e. Carr said that any good historian has the future in their bones. And I think the kind of modernist orientation was always towards the future. Um, but that's a different thing from the presentism. And I do think that historians have kind of have struggled, always have struggled with a writing history that is um, not presentist, but neither is antiquarian or is um, kind of publicly oriented um, or, and also academic. So these are kind of divisions of conflicts that historians are kind of juggle with. And, um, and I do think that within that conflict, the division between the past and history is really important because um, the past is where the myths live, right? So the past is where the public have this kind of collective notion of who you are, maybe as a nation or a people, whatever. And history is what historians write, okay? And historians see themselves as, as myth busters, so they go in and they write critically about the past, and they try to explode those myths. Now, previously, historians did that as a conversation with the public. So people like Richard Hofstadter, uh, um, uh, Lewis Hart, so I'm just thinking of American historians who talk to the public about the problems of the present, what we can learn from the past, and what we can take into the future. What's different today, I think, is that there is a real division between historians, whether they're public historians or academic historians, and the public, the audience. They don't have the same sort of respect for their audience. In fact, I think a lot of them have contempt for their audience. And so that this war on the past becomes this kind of hyper-critical um, myth-busting, and there is no engagement with an audience who, who might hold those myths as kind of precious um, understandings of themselves. Um, there's no respect for that. Um, Richard Hofstadter, for example, saw his audience as intelligent and understanding and kind of he treated with them respect. If you read something by, say, Jill Lepore today, she's talking about the American Revolution, she finger wags the public. She talks to them with contempt. She talks to the, she looks down to them of like, how can you be so ignorant and bigoted in your understanding of the past? So I think that's the real kind of shift now is that there is no engagement or discussion between the public and the historians, the people who write the history. I'll come back to the uh, panel. Uh, Ivan, can I start with you this time? Yes, the, this Ivan. How? Yes, this war on civilization. Um, one of the things I treasure the arts for is that they, they are, um, they, they, they do have a power of resistance to being corralled uh, to an agenda. They, art, works of art do fight back and there's that wonderful experience of you know, going to Tate, Tate Britain, looking at the tendentious anti-colonial label pinned to a picture, then looking at the picture and saying, actually, no. No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean what the label says, no. Um, and so they, we, we have to treasure that, I think. I'm sure it must annoy the ideologues no end that it has that power of resistance. My own art, you know, classical music, resists particularly strongly. One of the things I treasure about it Forgive me, I know this isn't really a response to any of your points, but it's all I know. You know. <laughs> it's, it's all I know about, honestly, so I have to stick with it. Um, um, 
Yeah, the great thing about classical music is that is this, this doesn't happen. When you go to a concert by the Philharmonia Orchestra or whatever, or a string quartet at the Wigmore Hall, you don't, you don't find that in the programme notes that you buy, there's some earnest lecture about, about how the second movement is all, a, is all about the f- f- fight against colonialism. You, you never read that. And it's so refreshing. <laughs> and, I, and I think the reason is, uh, and I think that this, this, must, this does make my art form peculiarly resistant to ideological capture, is that it, it, it manifests this thing of what I was talking about earlier between rules of thumb and rules uh, on two levels at once, not just the one. Um, there's the, uh, what you might call the outside time structure of harmony and counterpoint and so forth, which, we, which you can appreciate, um, as it were, free of the march of the clock. And then within music, as it's, as it's experienced, those things come to life in the moment in a way that is peculiarly, I would, I would, I would almost say, uniquely persuasive. And in, in that precious moment, you know, in that quarter of an hour or half an hour that you listen to the piece, you are protected. You, you, can't, you cannot be got at by the idealogues. It's fantastic. I recommend it as a tonic, you know. If, if, if you find that, you're, <laughs> that you really can't stand being lectured, and I, I so appreciate the point about Lady made about the tone in which we're lectured. Um, I, I once had the great misfortune to stumble across uh, an, an angry journal, online journal, called Everyday Feminism. Has anybody discovered this? And th- the exhortation over and again in this, in this journal is, educate yourself. Meaning, yeah, how, how can you be so ignorant? The arts don't really do that. They, they seduce you. They invite you in. And, and, and in the space of that half an hour when you're listening to the symphony, they, they catch you and they protect you. So, okay. so maybe that's one way through. Yeah, mm-hmm. great. Thanks, Ashley. So someone had commented that they want to see something good happen in the past. I mean, that's what I mean by treating the past like a, sci- like a scientist would treat an experiment or some kind of scientific treaties. I don't mean like base scientism, like, <laughs> uh, you, know, uh, you know, treating it like literally a natural science. That's not what I mean. I mean that you claim a, or show a proper deference to people as being of their times um, and for their time having done great things or having made a mistake <laughs> for their time. Um, if you look at like the history of science, people recognize that they're standing on the shoulders of giants. They give due deference to the people that came before them. And God willing, the, the activists don't get to that too, uh, where we don't have to say in a scientific paper, but Newton had that issue with black people. I don't know. <laughs> God willing, that never happens. But they, so they recognize the achievements that came before them and know that they're of their time, but that doesn't necessarily take away from the greatness of what they did. And we should do the same thing when it comes to history, um, that you know, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. They were attempting to solve a particular problem, and this is what happened. Now I, I and you, as we try to solve this new problem, we draw on the understanding the mistakes of the past in order to propose a new solution. Now, Marx gets a lot of blame for this, right? Oh, those Marxists, those cultural Marxists, it's a long march to the institutions and so on. But activists today have also thrown marks in the river along with the statues, because what they failed to realize that even for Marx, what he thought came next was already here. He was building on what already exists. I mean, this is just basic. It's in you know, the 18th Brumaire, right? We do not, man does not make history in conditions of his own choosing, um, but he makes it um, using circumstances that have been transmitted from the past um, in the German ideology. Um, we do not out- abolish the current way of things, that we are moving into a future that is already being made. People now read the word, what is translated in English as sublation, they understand that as abolition. They want to abolish everything that came before, but that's not how history works. Feudalism did not become capitalism by utterly abolishing everything that came before. And in fact, Marx makes this point constantly, that there are certain feudal throwbacks that exist within our society. That's just how history works. You don't just blow everything up and build it anew. That's okay. horrifying. Let's leave it there. That's a good, good place to leave it. Uh, Sean. I want to try and uh, address three points that were made from the floor. Um, the gentleman who mentioned about G.K. Chesterton and Dave's point about slave trade and uh, the person who, who, mentioned, who asked if it's sometimes important to forget things. Because at the heart of all of this, it seems to me, is that issue of myth. Um, 
and I do recognize that myth is important, but I'm not a great fan of myths because they can be damaging. And I suppose the classic example would be the, myth the mythology surrounding the foundation of the United States and actually creating this term, this strange term, founding fathers for a group of people at the end of the 18th century. And a very specific example would be the reverence, the almost religious reverence applied, therefore, to the American Constitution and to every aspect of it, leading up to the right to bear arms and to arm yourself like a third world, you know, like a, a sort of second-rate power or something, and, and, uh, and dare, you know, don't you dare touch my rifle. Because that actually is all part of the mythology of the creation of the United States. And I think mythology, if it's not challenged, can be very dangerous. Um, so I, do, I don't think it's a good idea to forget things. I think it's very important to face them fully. And something, Dave, you said, um, which I thought was very significant, because you said it would be more historically accurate. And I think that is a very important point to make. If you take the example of the slave trade, a fully comprehensive treatment of the story would indeed, it wouldn't shy away from the really crucial point that the slave trade played in 18th century Britain. And there I think the revisionists have, played us a, have done us a very good service. We do appreciate that. It wasn't just on the edge, the way I sort of learned about it and indeed taught about it as, as a teacher. But it's also part of a wider story of slavery. It becomes a more comprehensive story. And the story of the way in which the, um, the slave trade was indeed, you know, the, sort of the abolition was policed is part of it as well. The greater, the more accurate, the more comprehensive. It's not comfortable. It's not a comfortable story for anyone, not on either side of the debate. But it's a more accurate and more truthful one. And in that sense, much more valuable than a myth. OK, great. Thanks. Uh, Robert. Okay, well, I'm going to try to respond to some of the interesting points made very quickly. Uh, first of all, um, I was asked, did I think you should forget things in the past? And no, I don't. I don't think you can or that you should. Um, I think we do need to face up to our past, but we need to do it properly. Um, now, why, who's doing this was one question. Why, why is it all happening and who's behind it? I think David Goodhart's distinction between somewhere people and anywhere people is, for me, a very, very uh, enlightening. The people who are running many of our institutions are people who like to think of themselves as anywhere people. They, and many of them indeed are. They come from all over the world. They, would, they, they see themselves as part of a cosmopolitan society. For them, the nation state is outdated or, or damaging. Um, they, I th now, why the rules of thumb. Why have we in history, not only in the arts, why have we abandoned the rules of thumb, which are things like how to treat evidence, how to, how to, how to rationalize, how to, how to analyze. And it's, I think, partly, it's, we all know, it's a sort of postmodernist influence of uh, everything's a narrative, everything's oppressive. Um, there's no truth, there's just lots of different stories. And that, a lot of that comes, it seems to me, from literary theory, which I think has infected history. And, and many of the, the ways in which history has been practiced for the last 100 years or 150 years have been kind of marginalized so that people can more or less make things up. There was a notorious case recently, I won't mention any names, in which a, um, a reputable historian seems to have pretty deliberately misinterpreted documents in order to make a very interesting and controversial point about the Industrial Revolution being invented by slaves. Now, right, it's, well, okay, yeah, it's a narrative, therefore, what can you say? Um, the division between historians and the public, the way that people treat the public with, with, with contempt, I think that's often true. And it's because decisions are often being made by very tiny groups of unaccountable people who have taken control of a great many of our institutions and who feel that they can run them in any way they like. Uh, we have to take control of these institutions again. Uh, and it's going to be a very long and difficult job. And it's, it, it's true of museums, which many of which see themselves now as campaigning institutions, of universities, very similarly, of schools, too. Uh, but people who are, are making decisions in, in secret, without, or, without proper authority, without consultation, and are simply doing things because they think these are the things that ought to be done and that they want to do. OK, great. Thanks. A quick thought? Thank you, yeah. Quick is what is expected. So I'll try to be very, uh, very quick. And listen, I have been studying history like you in the 1980s, and I know my Bulgarian history. It was very classical national history. The problem is that if I go and tell this version of Bulgarian history in any restaurant in Serbia or Greece, I'm going to be beaten every day. <laughs> and they're not going to do better 
<laughs> if they're going to basically exercise their version. And then comes this important question to the relations to the nation state. One of the major things that happened is migration of people. And people are moving with their version of history. And then you basically try to reconcile history. And I do believe this is a political problem. It's not the problem of the past. And here where I do believe the mistake was made is that you cannot build identity simply on guilt. We cannot go to this restaurant and turn to the Greeks. We are bad, but you are also bad, and the Serbs are bad, and everybody is bad. Because in a certain way, this is it's fine. So, so what? And in my view, the biggest problem here is this story that you ending up and you said it's an attack on democracy. Yes, but it's also the result of democracy. Because in a certain way, people come, and in democracy, we have a two different idea of majority. One is the historical majority that built the nation state, but the other is the majority that comes out of elections. And they do not need, basically, to coincide ethnically or culturally. So I do believe from this point of view, it goes politically and sociologically much more deeper than some idiot somewhere uh, deciding to declare the war on the past because probably this is one of the war, the only war for which you have money to, uh, to pay for. <laughs> OK, great. Uh, I wanted to challenge Sean a bit on something you said earlier about education. Uh, you said that education can't be the silver bullet. Good point, but then if you listen to what Robert just said, and I wanted to challenge Robert as well, but he then made me think, oh, hang on a minute, he might have got the point. Um, Rob, Robert, you talked about the people who've taken over the institutions, the anywheres have taken over the institutions. You importantly referenced museums and schools. I guess my, my challenge is I was getting a bit nervous sitting here that it's getting a little bit comfortable, a little bit complacent, that we're all on the same page, we all understand the problem. But where's, the, where's that desire? Where's that organization? Where's that willingness to take back control? If you're not prepared to fight for your children's education and the sort of history they should be being taught, not prepared to wrest back control, then do you believe in the future? And maybe, maybe Ivan's point earlier is actually pretty key. Maybe we don't have enough belief of our own relationship to the future to have that fight. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to play devil's advocate somewhat, not so much with that, the challenge in the idea that there is a problem, but with the framing of the problem itself. So first off, the problems, uh, people seem to agree, is that there's a difficulty with our understanding of and grappling with and thereby integrating our relationship between past, present and future. So we don't frame it simply in those terms. So not, not only the title, it's war on the past, we've, we've escalated our language to in my, from my perspective, frankly, histrionic perspective, by calling it a war, war on civilization itself. Now, the problem, as we've seen over many years, with framing it in warlike civilizational terms, whether it's a war on drugs, a war on terror, a war on COVID, is that you end up conceiving of everything in terms of survival as an existential risk. And when we conceive of everything in those terms, our principal focus, our primary concern, concern inevitably becomes with the present itself. Because all we're, if all we're concerned with is reacting against these forces of evil that are trying to beat down the gates, if all we're trying to do is survive, the most, most important thing we can do is focus on the now. So there's an ironic and like almost tragic situation in which we're trying to confront this parochialism of the present through an attack a, a, that's manifesting itself through an attack on history. We're confronting it in such a way that we're helping to reproduce the problem itself. So yes, there is a difficulty we're having with grappling the relationship between the three temporal components of our lives. But to catastrophize, to call an attack on civilization itself, strikes me as being part of the problem. Richard Kipling was arguably one of the greatest writers of all time. And in recent years, there has been talk of rewriting his books and his poems to make them more acceptable to the modern ideas. And I think that this idea is quite farcical, actually, because why would you change this if, as many people on the panel and in the audience have said, he was doing stuff, he was writing what was acceptable for his time, and he wasn't actually writing two obscene things. And think of it, if Charles Dickens were rewriting books to make them more acceptable for his age's opinions on things, 
then would we have great books that he's written, like A Tale of Two Cities? No. So I think that something that we can learn from this is that we shouldn't be obsessed with criticizing the past. Instead, we should try and lay the way for a bright path for the future. And as Richard Kipling said, we should keep our heads about us when all around us others are losing theirs and blaming it on us. <laughs> Very good. So, well said, young man. Um, just a, a quick and hopefully more humorous uh, question. The debate has touched on the impact of past history on the present within the arts. I'm interested in the panel's view on architecture. Do they favor buildings which fit in with the historic past in the city nostalgically, or do they prefer to see new buildings with new designs and new materials? I wanted to pick up on a point which I thought was very well made about the way we present the past as being entirely negative around slavery and Britain and so on, and uh, the gentleman counterposed the role of the Royal Navy and the West Africa Squadron in liberating slaves. I have a bit of a problem with that, although the point was well made. This may be one for Robert to pick up on, so I think it might even be an argument he's made. The original argument seems to be casting anyone who is British, which may be a genetic thing, I'm not quite sure, as being bad because they were involved in slavery and they are bad because they like to enslave people and they profit from it and they profit today. It seems to be making a counter-argument saying, well, Britain actually lost you know, tens of thousands of Royal Navy ratings, uh, spent, you know, whatever it was, 5% of its annual budget on, uh, you know, fighting the slave trade, falls into the same trap because essentially you're saying, well, okay, we might have been bad, but we're good and we should be able to take that goodness now and use it in some way to validate ourselves. Whereas the reality is you can make another argument, which uh, CLR James and others have made, is that Britain destroyed the slave trade because it was an act of war against less advanced nations which had a, a more primitive economy. So you can't really win that argument. And it seems to me we shouldn't be just trying to validate ourselves by saying we were good or bad because of things that happened in the past. We should say perhaps we can learn from those things because we can experience them because of we are we being in the place right. we are today. Uh, and that is a good thing, but it doesn't make us genetically or in other ways somehow better or worse as a result. Let's get down to brass tacks. About 200 yards from where we're sitting is a statue of Robert Clive, Clive of India. That statue tells a very simple story of the conquest of one people by another. Now, in this room here are the descendants of the conquerors and the descendants of the conquered. It's not a very helpful story for social cohesion. So, what do we do with Clive? Okay, yeah. great. Um, I'll just, I did a survey recently, 60% of Americans believe the following statement, native peoples lived in peace and harmony before European settlers arrived in North America. <laughs> so, that's just a bit of framing to say, is one of the problems the overcritical view of the West or of oppressed, oppressor groups, partly caused by the under or the lack of criticism of the so-called oppressed groups and the lack of realism and the romanticism of many of these groups. Okay, great. So finally here then, our panel. Just a quick word for Ivan, the, uh, not the terrible, but the musician. <laughs> um, I don't know, but I, I'm a recent convert to classical music and I've discovered this channel with the most wonderful vowels, the most wonderful vowels always read by pucker middle-class English women. It's called Radio 3. <laughs> and on Radio 3, the big event every night is heavy metal, uh, black slavery chanting, African chanting, uh, every kind of music that is not the half hour of Beethoven that you can immerse yourself in, but is about... 90 hours of lecturing, finger wagging over the radio, if that can be done, and it's a real shock. There was I, a Philistine all my life. I tune into Radio 3, I'm getting more heavy metal. Okay, great. Uh, so let's sum up in the kind of reverse order in which we spoke. So we'll start with Ashley. There's plenty for us on the table. We haven't really fully grappled with the second part of the title, the kind of where does the public fit into these kind of discussions about 
the past. I'd also make a little plea actually for forgetting. I'm not sure I want to live in a society where we're constantly always aware, woke, if you like, about everything that's ever gone on all of the time. There has to be some measure of letting the past go at some level. Um, but, Ashley. Um, yeah, I do th about catastrophizing. I do think you can go too far, but I think we need to be aware that the end, uh, endless subversion makes it very difficult to grapple with some very real problems that face us. Um, so we should not lose our heads. Uh, um, don't respond by seeing the answer as an equally shrill reassertion of the past, but to actually tackle the misanthropy that underlies some of this pessimism, this idea that human beings are essentially a destructive force on the world, and that at some point in the perhaps distant past, we went too far, and now we, there's no going back. So this creates this sort of sense of an end of civilization, an end of times, and that if you're a progressive type, you should accept this. You should see this as really the end, and so be it. What happened before wasn't any good anyway. And we should remember, people, what was the heart of the progressive project going back to the 18th century. It was a refusal and a denial of limits. So if you think of someone like Condorcet, writing in 1795, outlines of the historical view of the progress of mankind outlines of the historical view of the progress of mankind. One of the most optimistic texts ever written. He goes through all of human history and he says in the future, the human lifespan will know of no upper limit. Now even that is gone. The progressive project is all about accepting limits. We have to deny that, refound some of that optimism. So I think we need to reject yeah. misanthropy, bring forward optimism, and take hold of the future. OK, very good. No, we'll save the applause, because otherwise you might not even get to the next session in time. Um, but Robert. Okay, very quickly, um, did Native Americans live in peace and harmony? Was the, the, the history of British relations with India one of the conquest of one people by another? No and no. So the, re the way of coping with these problems is to tell things as they really were, as Ranker put it in the 19th century. Now, oh, a model of pithiness. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, you've even surprised me there. Oh, right. Okay, so, uh, Sean. I like Clive precisely because he, specifically because he had no ethics, no morals, but he didn't claim to have. And I tend to think that more, more damage is done by people who make a big thing of their own morals. Um, Rudyard Kipling, similarly, I get all my students to read Kipling, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, very important writer, historically very significant. Architecture, I like new designs, but new designs which show some courtesy to their surroundings. And lastly, to the point where you, you raised, who essentially you're asking who controls education. Not an easy one to answer. Come along to the debate tomorrow about Ofsted that I'm speaking. In. Um, but, I, but it's not teachers, and it's not the institutions like historical associations, so I do think it has to come from the public, and it has to come through politics. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, so, Ivan, here. Oh, well, just two things. Um, the gentleman who thinks we should just chill out, you know, and, 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 and stop getting so hysterical about the you know, end of civilization, um, that would be fine if, if our ideological adversaries ag agree to meet us on equal terms and, 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 and have a pleasant debate. But I, I have been assured by an extremely distinguished professor of history in Cambridge, no less, that the, the very idea of, of politesse, you know, of courtesy and giving space to the other person is itself a colonialist imposition. <laughs> <laughs> to prove it, she took our private correspondence and plastered it all over social media in order to encourage a social media pylon, which failed, bless her. It, it was a terrible damp squib. Um, Radio 3. Um, well, indeed. <laughs> uh, I, I used to... Radio 3 way of putting it. Um, <laughs> yeah. What can one say, really? I mean, I, I, you and I must be listening to different, different channels, honestly, because I, I don't notice any plummy-voiced ladies like Patricia Hughes anymore. Would that we did, you know? That, wouldn't that be marvellous? Instead, I get a kind of rather earnest, earnest attempt at being a rather sweatily demotic, you know? Uh, rather self-consciously demotic. <laughs> but Beethoven you can still find, honestly, I promise OK, great. Uh, so, uh, finishing us off, Ivan. Thank you very much. Listen, it's not easy with the civilization talk, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm Bulgarian. We have been from 14th century to 19th, part of the Ottoman Empire. We didn't enslave anybody. We have been enslaved. But in now, in order to feel as part of the Western civilization, you should feel the colonial guilt. And from this point of view, this is destroying civilization. It is also making it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.